talking about joint work with uh, Lance Lochner uh, back there, so um, he might jump in periodically to rescue me. <laughs> so there are a lot of studies on borrowing constraints uh, at college going ages, but most of these studies take early, uh, earlier investments and in family transfers as given. And, and they find borrowing constraints aren't that important, but that adolescent abilities are very important. Okay, so what we want to do here is study the role uh, of constraints and family transfers in determining those adolescent abilities uh, as well as later schooling choices uh, and earnings. Okay, so you can imagine, I mean these studies show, uh, that policies and constraints uh, don't have that much of an effect on schooling choices and earnings when you take these adolescent abilities as given. Um, but if you uh, allow these constraints and family transfers to affect the adolescent abilities, um, it's possible that they could have uh, large impacts on schooling choices and earnings. Okay, so what do we know about early borrowing constraints? Um, there's some consumption studies that suggest borrowing constraints are more salient for younger families. Uh, it's also the case that young parents may have large college debts themselves uh, and typically earn less when their children are young. And there's some indirect evidence that suggests early constraints may inhibit uh, investment. There's large long-run impacts of, of early interventions like the Perry Preschool Program. Um, there's also uh, work that shows poor parents spend mu much less time and money uh, investing in their children. Uh, and it's also the case that early income has relatively large impacts uh, on achievement uh, and educational attainment. So we're going to provide a little bit more evidence uh, on this point. Uh, and the idea is uh, that if borrowing constraints aren't binding, there shouldn't be uh, differential effects uh, of when, when you earn your income. So timing of income shouldn't be important uh, if you're not constrained because you can shift income uh, around. But in fact, uh, we find that the timing of income is important uh, for educational outcomes. Uh, so this is data from the children of the NLSY. Uh, and we look at the effects of family income earned when the child is young or early income. That's between the ages of 0 and 11. Uh, and when the child is older, that's late income, between the ages of 12 and 23. We look at the effects uh, of this income on their completed education, uh, whether or not they graduate high school, uh, attend some college, uh, or graduate college. And you can see here uh, the impacts of getting an extra $10,000 in present discounted value of annual income uh, when the child is young uh, has a 2.6 uh, percentage point increase on the uh, completing college. Uh, and 4.6 uh, percentage point increase on whether or not they attend college. And if you look at the effects of late income, you can see they're much smaller uh, and st st statistically <laughs> insignificant. That's not something I normally say. Um, <laughs> I'm not the empirical person. Uh, <laughs> but you can see uh, this isn't true for all um, educational uh, levels. When we look at uh, college graduates, um, the, the difference isn't. Uh, as great. So part of, there's two reasons why I wanted to, to point this out. Uh, a motivationary uh, um, point, uh, this is just one more piece uh, of evidence that's consistent with the fact that early borrowing constraints could be playing a role. Um, just a second. And also, this is um, going to uh, highlight what our empirical strategy, not empirical, but our calibration strategy is going to be later in the paper, um, trying to uh, pin down the extent of borrowing constraints by looking at how much the timing of income matters uh, for educational outcomes. Yep. But are we increasing shock? I mean, how, how, you know, we have more income people who have, I mean, are you controlling for total income and then looking at how it's played? Yeah. So you control for total income? Yep. Okay. But we still don't know if these are anticipated or unanticipated. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are issues with that. So we're just going to say this is consistent with that, but there could be. All right, so there's a, a bunch of other literature, the macro literature that looks at um, intergenerational human capital investment, um, some structural estimations, um, and then some people who are looking at um, the dynamics of, of the human uh, capital production function. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do here is just give you a rough idea of what our model is going to look like. 
um, summarize a bit of the analytical results that we have that help us interpret uh, our quantitative results, but hopefully spend most of my limited time uh, on the quantitative results. Okay, so in order to think about timing of income and, and, and investment, we need to have at least two periods of investment. So we'll have an early and late uh, childhood investment. Um, there are going to be financial transfers that go from parents to children. And probably should have reordered these things. Um, these uh, transfers uh, can't be negative. So parents can't be taking uh, from their children, um, which is uh, potentially a binding constraint because if you're a poor parent and you have a very able child, um, you may want to be uh, extracting resources from them. Uh, we'll have asset accumulation, uh, and then we'll allow for borrowing constraints uh, over the life cycle. Okay, so kind of build up. Uh, a nested version of this model. We start with a life cycle model uh, to analytically understand how early and late investments interact uh, with transfers uh, and borrowing constraints. And then we extend these results to a two-generation model um, where parents are deciding how much uh, to transfer to the kids um, and for investments and consumption. And so these parental transfers, which are taken exogenous in the first stage, uh, are then endogenized. And what we find is once we endogenize parental transfers, all of the results that we found uh, in the life cycle model still uh, carry through. Uh, and then we think about a fully dynastic model, and we do this quantitatively, where we have heterogeneity and ability, uncertainty and earnings, and we use intergenerational microdata uh, to calibrate this model. And what I want you to have uh, in your head as we're going through this is that there are a lot of things that are going on, um, but what we discovered when we did this project is there are some key uh, lessons that we learned uh, that weren't all obvious uh, when we started. And so I want to think about this as more of a big picture uh, uh, kind of uh, project. Okay, so before I go into anything, I need to talk a little bit about uh, human capital production function for children because that's going to be uh, key uh, to this work. So kids differ by their ability theta, which can depend on uh, their parents' ability. And your human capital uh, upon labor market entry, which is going to be period three, that's why it's H sub three, uh, is your ability uh, times this function of, of your early and your late investments. Um, your human capital is increasing in concave uh, in both investments. And how these investments interact is going to be key here. Uh, so what we call dynamic complementarity is, is um, how complementary they are. Uh, and if they're very complementary, optimal uh, early investment and late investment uh, are going to move together. And it's going to be, if they're very complementary, it's, it's going to be difficult to make up for deficiencies in early investment uh, with later investment. Yeah. When you say investment, do you mean only monetary investment? I would have thought that time is very important. Yeah, so we're going to not think take a specific stand on what this investment is, uh, but you can think about it as time. Well, so yeah, we're going to be thinking about uh, the, the, specifically the later investment is going to take into account foregone earnings, so there'll be uh, time there. And I, I think we want to think about uh, this early investment is also uh, that the time that, that parents spend. I mean, it is a little hard to think about this, and it's something that we're kind of struggling with now, thinking about exactly what these investments are and how constraints affect them. Uh, but there is this evidence that poor parents spend not only less goods on their kids, but less time. Um, it's not entirely clear what would happen, what happens when they get more income, um, but it does seem like there is some evidence that when parents do get more income, things go better for their kids. Um, but how exactly that works? One of the things that you're ruling out here is the direct effects of parental human capital on um, kids. So you transition it to grandchildren, human capital directly. Why is that the uh... Yeah, yeah. It's only going to be coming through. I mean, I guess you can, you can affect your grandkids' human capital through your, yeah, your kid having more human capital and, and more assets. Um, and, and there is this link that they don't have any control over, but in, in the way ability is correlated across generations. Oh, and one last thing to just point out. Um, all, all the interesting stuff about human capital in this paper is going to be in the first two periods when you're a kid. Um, once you become an adult, it's just going to um, uh, move exogenously. All right, so when we want to think about um, our intergenerational uh, analytical model, so this is just a summary. I haven't obviously written it down, so I just want to give you some of the key findings. Um, we'll talk about the effects of borrowing constraints, the effects of changes in transfers and income, uh, and also well, some other things. <laughs> but first, we'll start with the effects of borrowing constraints. 
Okay, so one thing uh, is true, that borrowing constraints in any period, not just when you're investing, but when you're an adult, if you face borrowing, potentially face borrowing constraints when you're an adult, uh, can lead or do lead to underinvestment in at least one period. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that relaxing a borrowing constraint at one of the childhood stages almost always increases investment in that period, and it's going to increase investment in the other period if these investments uh, are sufficiently complementary. And I think it's uh, important uh, to point out that what's really key here is not just the effect of borrowing constraints, but how borrowing constraints interact uh, with this dynamic concept of dynamic complementarity. So if investments are fairly substitutable uh, in this production function, it doesn't really matter that much uh, if parents are borrowing constrained because they can make up uh, for a deficiency in early investments later. But if there is this dynamic complementarity, then there's going to be a bigger impact of borrowing constraints. OK, so what about uh, the effects of uh, changes in transfers uh, in income? OK, so if no constraints are binding, investments are going to be independent of transfers in income. Uh, if only the late constraint binds, so when the kid is at the college age, Investments are going to depend only on the present discounted value of transfers and income. So the key here is if only the late constraint binds, the timing of income in the first and the second period uh, isn't, isn't going to matter. Um, parents can move that income around within those two periods. Okay, if the early constraint binds, then the timing of income is going to be important, uh, along with dynamic complementarity uh, in determining the response uh, to changes in income and transfers. Okay, so what we find is early investment is always increasing in early income. If only the early constraint binds, early investment is decreasing in late income because this is just going to exasperate that constraint. Um, but if both early and late constraints bind, uh, investments in both periods uh, increase in income in either period, if and only if we have sufficient uh, dynamic complementarity. Okay, so part of why I wanted to talk about this is if we think about those empirical results I put up uh, at the beginning, um, it suggests that we have binding early and late constraints and strong dynamic complementarity. Because we saw that there were asymmetric responses, um, that means the early constraints must bind. Uh, and because late investments are increasing uh, in early and late income, about this uh, is that if you have a policy that comes into to play only when you're investing, so this transfer policy only happens when you're young, uh, that's going to have different effects than if that policy uh, is permanent. Okay? So if the policy also hits uh, when you become older, um, that's going to have a, a negative impact uh, on your investments. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that's, I mean, this, the reason why I'm pointing this out is one of the things, I mean, maybe I shouldn't highlight that how, how I wasn't really aware of all of this when we were doing this, but it was one of these cases where we started getting some empirical res and quantitative results back that weren't making a lot of sense. So then we went back to our analytical model and then kind of started to disentangle these effects. So you really do need to do things quantitatively uh, to figure out which way things are going to go. All right. Oops, sorry. Um, I, this is for the U.S. Yep. So then, what you're really you're thinking about what? You're thinking about the school jobs basically public. Are you thinking about people getting enough money so if you move to a different neighborhood to send their kids to get? Yeah. So you could think about that. So we're gonna when we do the I'll talk about it in a minute. There'll be some free uh, public investment that everybody gets, and then you can uh, supplement that. 
Um, and so you can think about that living in a different neighborhood. You can think about, I mean, we think about this a lot now that we have a kid that we're doing these investments in. Uh, what exactly are these investments and, and how do they matter? So I don't know, going to museums, summer camps, different, the books that you buy. Everything before school, too. Yeah, yeah. All right, so when we think about uh, our dynastic model, um, there's people are going to live six periods. Uh, when you're a young child and an old child, those are your first two periods. Then you become a young parent and old parent. Those are your third and fourth periods. We're kind of running out of terminology. <laughs> become a post-parent in period five. Uh, and then you're retired uh, in period six. Um, and we're going to assume that once an old parent and old child finish up being old parents and old children, that they separate. Okay, so there's, we're not going to have grandparents involved uh, in this relationship. Okay, so once an old child becomes a young parent, the relationship between them and their parent is, is over. Yeah, so, but it has to end there. So there can't be any transfers that happen after that point. No sex? Like sex of gender of parents? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Actually, no sex. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Probably more once you become a post parent. Yeah, so we don't have any, there's no gender here. Uh, I'm sorry, okay. when, when you talk about parents, you talk about a unit, I mean, a couple, I mean, or a one parent. I mean, yeah, so. In the model, it's one parent. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is certainly something that is important um, that we don't deal with here. Um, but when we're, th yeah, yeah, just one parent. So when we look at the data, what do you think? Uh, so we do, it is just one parent's income, right, that we, in this. Uh, it's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can ask when you get some well, data. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I hooked up with an empirical guy. <laughs> All right, so we're also going to allow for human capital investment subsidies. Uh, in, in the calibration S1, the early subsidy is going to be zero because there's not a lot of subsidy that happens at that point. Um, and they'll, like I said, be free public uh, investments. Um, the old kids are going to have uh, some potential earnings. Young children can't work, borrow, or save. Um, they'll be shocks to parental earnings. And the asset accumulation is going to be subject to human capital specific borrowing constraints. So this parameter gamma, is the light? Ooh, yeah, right there. Um, this parameter, parameter gamma is going to um, tell us how, uh, how tight uh, these constraints are. Uh, and you, if, if gamma were one, you could borrow up to uh, the minimum discounted future earnings uh, from that point on. Um, Yeah, W two is known and it's yeah, it's fixed. It's non-stochastic. Yeah, non-stochastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no shocks to the the. That just happens when you become a parent. Um, and there's non-negative uh, financial transfers uh, from parent to children. So again, the parent can't be uh, extracted. It's they're not going to extract from their young kids because their young kids don't have anything. Uh, but their older kids, uh, it, it's possible that they might want to. Um, and the degree of altruism is measured by uh, rho. Um, and how do I, is there a way to, do I have to go up to here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I'm really running out of time, so maybe I'll skip that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the problems are pretty standard. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so some assumptions for the computation. Um, we're going to use a CES type human capital uh, production function. Uh, there's going to be a discrete number of early investments I1. Um, which, as we've said, we're just not going to take a strong stand on what they are. Uh, but the late investments, um, we're going to co have those correspond uh, to final uh, schooling outcomes. So you could be a high school dropout, a high school graduate, have some college uh, or college graduate and beyond. We're going to have two ability levels, high and low, uh, and an intergenerational Markov process. Uh, the distribution of earning checks are going to be uh, log normal, and we'll just use a standard uh, utility function. I guess that would have been to go through the problems. Uh, Add it to the temporal. Sorry? Add it to the temporal. Well, that means you're ruling out intertemporal risk aversion. 
purely a mass fund based account? Yes. Correlation of those that you're ruling out these temporal, by assuming an additive in the temporal utility function, you're ruling out uh, aversion to smoothness out of time, which seems to be quite crucial to this matter. No, it's 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 yeah. Yeah, it's tied to the in, in temporal necessity. We're not separating the inverse of the relative risk of variance. Right, we're not it's separating those two parameters. That's true. So people are in temporally risk neutral. No. They just were pinning down, the, the risk aversion is pinned down by the intertemporal elasticity of substitution there. Um, the inverse of so this is why I didn't click on concept of correlation aversion, intertemporal risk aversion? I... Well, I'll, I'll email it separately. Okay, separate yeah, but I, I mean, there is, and people do want to smooth. Yeah, yeah, people want to smooth, but there's a different concept from atemporal risk aversion from intertemporal risk aversion. Okay, yeah, temporal. this may be something that I should talk to you after. All right, so as I said, there's six uh, periods beginning at birth. Um, we're going to fix, this isn't uh, general equilibrium, we're going to fix R. Um, set sigma equal to 2. Everything's going to be in $2,008, um, and things will be annualized. Okay, so we're going to estimate W2, that's the potential earnings of uh, these older kids, uh, and the I2 amounts based on foregone earnings levels uh, in the NLSY. Uh, and direct costs from the dig digestive education statistics. We're going to assume a grid for the I1 um, of seven points between zero and 15,000. We're going to set the public investments uh, and these subsidies based on per capita public schooling expenditures, tuition levels, and total costs. And then the way human capital uh, exogenously grows once you become a parent um, is going to uh, be determined by gamma four and gamma five, and we set to match uh, growth rates and earnings in the NLSY. Uh, in the 2006 March CPS. All these other parameters that we have, uh, we're going to simultaneously cal calibrate um, via uh, SMM. Um, so we have a whole bunch of moments. Um, well, we have a whole bunch of parameters too, but we have even more moments <laughs> than parameters. Uh, so what are we going to fit to? Uh, the unconditional education distribution. Uh, the distribution of annual earnings for men um, who are uh, young adult, young parents. Uh, and old parent ages, uh, their mean and standard deviation. That's going to help us get at, let's see, this is the earning shock distribution uh, and then the level uh, of human capital. We're going to also look at child education, conditional on the mother's education and the parental income quartiles uh, when the kid is young and when the kid is older. Uh, and that's going to get at how important the timing of income is uh, for educational outcomes and will help us get at um, the borrowing constraint parameter uh, and how complementary uh, these uh, investments are. And then look, and, and, and since we condition on the mother's education, that's going to help us get uh, at the correlation of abilities um, over generations. And we're also going to look at uh, average child wages condition on their own education, their mother's education and parental income quartile early, uh, which is going to help us get at some of those human capital production function parameters. Of the parents, yeah. And the other yeah. is uh, the uncertainty uh, in the uh, parents' um, income. Mm -hmm. so, so here, the uncertainty in the parents' income is identified with the uh, conditional um, heterogeneity of um, income, conditional on the variables. Is that how this works? I'm just trying to figure out where, where you get the size of, or the amount of um, the uncertainty. So well, I think that this is coming from I mean, it, it, that it, stuff. It's a little bit tricky because it's, you can't just estimate the amount of that alone because it's going to be the education you observe, so that's going to give you, tell you something about the human capital, but there's also early investments which we don't claim to observe. But that relationship is going to come from inter, the relationship between parental income and kids. Right. So you're kind of essentially identifying off the variance of, of wages, say, roughly conditional on their education and maybe their parental resources. So conditional on the model prediction, essentially. Sort of. So the assumption is that people don't really know Well, there's there's heterogeneity in ability, so there is two there are types of, of ability. But people know their ability because they know the W two, right? People know their ability. Okay, yeah, so that, that that word potential kind of threw me because. Well, the, when I said potential earnings, I meant that 
the I-2, the investments take into account foregone earnings. Um, so W-2 is what you could earn if you just worked the whole period and didn't attend school. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to say we find a bunch of dynamic complementarity here. Uh, the elasticity of substitution between the investments uh, is 0.48. Um, there's um, people can borrow about half the minimum of their discounted future earnings. Um, and let's see, education distribution, how do we do? Um, we do pretty well here on the high school graduate and beyond. We do really well on the some college uh, and beyond, and we're a bit off uh, on the college graduate uh, and beyond. If you want to think about how investments differ, so this now is a steady state outcome, um, by parental uh, education, you can see there is um, quite a range uh, between kids who have high school dropout parents and kids who have uh, college graduate parents. Um, and when we looked at this and compared it uh, to measured expenditures on child enrichment um, by parental education reported in, in a Koshal paper, um, it was amazingly similar. Okay, so. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They still, I know they still increase because that's what we compared to uh, in that paper. Annual amounts, yeah. And it's beyond what the public expenditure is. OK, so think about constraints. 51% of young parents are constrained. 12% of old parents uh, are at their borrowing limit. No old children uh, are at their borrowing limit, which is consistent with uh, some of the other work that looks at um, constraints at college-going ages. Um, and it turns out 5% of old parents make zero transfers to their kids. So those are the parents, poor parents with pretty much able, it's all poor parents with able children um, uh, who would like to extract some resources from their kid. Um, you can see this isn't monotone here. Uh, basically, these guys are quite constrained because they have a lot of debt um, or on average because they went to college. Um, so they're more likely to enter uh, young parenthood with debt. And they're also more likely to have able children whom they want to invest in. Um, and these guys, uh, they are, um, typically people who got a bad earning shock, and it's pretty bad to get a bad earning shock uh, when you're already poor. All right, so some of the policy experiments that I'll have to kind of whip through. We're going to relax uh, borrowing constraints and look at the effects of that. Think about education subsidies, uh, what happens when you have early versus late subsidies, um, and potentially look at the difference uh, between income transfers and loans for young parents. Yeah, 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 for people doing things uh, in a very different, with yeah. different approaches, yeah. All right, so what happens if we allow young parents to borrow uh, 2,500 more? So whether or not we look at short run effects of this and long run effects uh, makes a big difference. Uh, in the short run, uh, you can see the average I1 goes up uh, 11%. Um, if you look at the, the total impact, uh, it's 1.5% increase uh, in average wages. Um, whether or not your parent is, you know, the education level of your parent does matter for how this affects you. Um, college graduate parents uh, respond uh, more, um, and their kids get a bigger increase uh, in average wages. But one thing that is interesting is even for people who uh, were unconstrained before, this policy changes their decisions. Uh, because of the dynastic aspect of this. Okay, so you know that when you're an old kid, none of them are constrained, I already said that, but they face the possibility of future constraints. So it's likely they'll be constrained uh, as young parents, and that's going to affect uh, their decisions uh, as an old kid. And so what happens when you increase the borrowing limits for young parents, older kids uh, borrow more, uh, and, and their parents also recognize the fact uh, that they're going to be in better shape uh, when they become parents themselves, and their parents transfer less uh, to them. So what ends up happening is after this first period uh, of the policy, we end up getting a leftward shift in the asset distribution. Uh, so um, young parents have more debt. Some of them have more human capital. Um, but because of the shift, uh, the long run impacts um, are, are basically a wash uh, on wages. All right. So. I just said this. Uh, one of the things that happens 
well, clearly in the long run, you're going to have fewer parents, young parents constrained because they can borrow more now. More old parents are going to be constrained because they borrowed more as young parents. And I think what's also kind of interesting is what I was just mentioning. Um, uh, more parents become transfer constrained in the sense that they're not transferring anything uh, to their kids. Yep. <coughs> What these investments what are. <laughs> Ten years later. <laughs> so, um, turns out when we increase borrowing limits for old parents and old kids, that has a little effect on human capital investment, which is consistent with some of this earlier work. All right, so some time to talk about uh, subsidies. So, we think about um, uh, comparing two subsidies, an early subsidy uh, and a late subsidy. Um, both policies are going to cost about $900 per capita, so that's why they're somewhat comparable. Um, one thing to think about with this uh, changing the earlier subsidy is people invest more in, in early uh, investments. And because of that, and because of the complementarity, they're going to invest more later. And those investments are already subsidized. And so that's going to increase the cost. So part of the cost of the, we're going to assume part of the cost of the early subsidy is the increase in later subsidies that come from uh, more early investments. No, yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Really? Which one? There's no tax. Subsidies come from it. They are not financed by taxing people. There's no federal stamp for it. Yeah, yeah. Canada is giving money to the U.S. I don't know. Oh, there's no modulation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is also the, something we would like to do. Yeah, yeah. Over here, over here, you can compare just early versus late, where the cost is the same. So, if you want to put a flat tax or something, these help you compare. So, these, these are. No, but again, these matter. So, when you make an investment in goods, that just matters. Eh? So, I'm not saying they don't matter. I'm just saying same. comparing whether you. We're trying to compare as close as we can apples to apples in, in our. So, same framework. cost program. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Versus same cost on old. Yeah. Not. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, Taxes and how you tax, that's something that is clear is going to matter. But. All right, so let's think about the short run and long run effects of subsidies are very similar, uh, unlike uh, the loan policy. So we're just going to talk about the short run effects. Let's see if you can even see here. <laughs> so uh, one thing to note, well, there'll be a few things to note, but the first thing is is an increase in the early subsidy obviously increases I1 quite a bit, but it also increases I2 quite a bit. Okay, so this dynamic complementarity uh, comes into play, uh, and there's very fairly substantial impacts uh, on average wages. Now, if we increase uh, the late subsidy, you know, that's going to increase late investments, uh, but it doesn't have as big of an impact on early investments uh, as the earlier subsidy has on, on late investments, and that's because young parents, a lot of young parents are unable to respond uh, to this change in policy later because they're constrained. I, um, and, and I guess I should go here where that's bolded. Um, one thing that we wanted to, to show is how important it is to think about the early responses to late policies. So we, the increase in S2, the middle line there, is taking to, into account uh, the response uh, in the earlier period to this later policy. This last line holds the early investment fix, so it doesn't allow parents to respond early. So you can kind of pretend like there's, there's not an earlier period. Uh, and you can see, well, obviously, by assumption, I1 changes zero. But because of the dynamic complementarity, there's not as much of an increase uh, in I2. And you can see there's a substantial differences uh, in, in their total impact. Okay? So taking into account this early investment in period and how it responds uh, to late policy uh, is important. All right. Are these all city state comparisons? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that. Yes, that's right. But the, uh, All the other ones yeah, 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 yeah. So long, where is the long run? Steady state. The short run, yeah, the short run is the one period in. Yeah. 
All right, and so I think maybe the, the last thing that I want to point out before I end uh, is we also looked at what happens if you increase uh, the public schooling. Okay, so when you increase the subsidies, what that does is it says here encourage early investments for everyone, but really what it does is encourage early investments. Like 15 minutes. Oh, I was thinking I started at nine. Oh, I should slow down. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> should have looked at you and not the clock. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So what it, it does is it encourages early investments for the people who are already investing. You know, of course, the people who are at a corner, you know, moves them a little bit closer uh, to investing, but they still may not uh, uh, respond to the policy. Okay, so what happens is it's the parents who are already investing. Those are the, the wealthier parents who have uh, more able kids. Okay, so the effect of the marginal subsidies uh, early, uh, the largest effects are going to be on college outcomes. Now, if you increase uh, free public schooling, um, this P1, um, so that's giving it to everybody, this largely is going to crowd out the private investments. The people who are already investing, they just invest a little less of their own. Um, but it increases total investment for anybody who is at the corner. Okay, so these are going to have dis different distributional effects. Uh, so the biggest effect of increasing public schooling is going to be uh, on high school completion and attending some college. But there aren't uh, uh, very large effects uh, or very negligible effects on, on college completion. Okay, so it's going to have a weaker impact uh, in human capital wages. Oof, OK. So. Um, here, what we do is we look at the difference. Uh, so this is a short run. <laughs> difference uh, of, of a $2,500 income transfer versus a $2,500 loan. Clearly, these aren't going to be the same in terms of how much they cost. Um, the loan policy only provides liquidity, while the transfer also uh, generates wealth effects. Okay, so if you think about or you look at the short run effects of, of these permanent policy changes. So we, you know when they hit, they're going to be uh, in play forever. And you look at the short run effects, the effects one generation out. Um, and, and this seemed a little weird to us when we first saw it, that the loan has bigger impacts uh, on investment uh, than the transfer does. Now, why is it that when you get a loan that is going to increase your investment more uh, than if you get just some free money? And it turns out that this difference between the current effects that I talked about early on with the analytical results, um, the effects that happen when you're investing uh, versus the future effects, the effects of the policy when you have already invested, um, is really important here. So there are larger current effects uh, from increasing uh, the child's parental resources when you have a transfer, which would be comparable to a one-time policy that just happened uh, while you were investing. But there are more negative future effects by increasing the child's resources when he becomes a parent. Um, which is what happens. You have to take that into account when you have a multi-generational uh, policy. Okay, so this, I think, is, is, is uh, important for two reasons. One, there's a big difference whether the policy is a one-time policy versus a multi-generational policy. But it also highlights the importance of thinking about these dynastic effects uh, and what they do um, even in the short run uh, to people's decisions. So these are incentive effects, like you said, that's reverse incentive effects? Yeah. Right, right, right. Could you remind us, like the government calibration, what was the discount rates of each generation? What was that? 5% 5 5 annual. annual? And they're all the same? Yeah. Discount rates. Well, now I'll get you all ahead of schedule. <laughs> OK, so um, due to the dynamic complementarity in human capital production, policies in one period affect decisions in other periods. Um, so it's important to think about both periods. Uh, it's difficult to make up for early investment deficits with later policies, like you could if, if things were fairly substitutable. Uh, this dy dynamic complementarity in conjunction with early borrowing constraints uh, means that early subsidies have a bigger impact uh, than late subsidies. If you ignore the early investment response uh, responses of these policies, you underestimate uh, the impact of later policies by quite a bit. Um, the effects of policy can be very different in the short run versus the long run. That was what we looked at with the, uh, allowing young parents to borrow more um, because there's shifts in the asset distribution. Uh, the nature of the subsidy matters. So whether or not you uh, increase uh, the marginal subsidy S1 or you give people f everybody free uh, increase in public schooling is pretty uh, important for, for what the outcomes are. Uh, and one-time transfers have stronger positive effects on investments than their permanent counterparts. So thinking about um, whether a policy is one-time uh, or permanent uh, is important for, 
um, what happens. So that's something that I think is really important to think about. But at this point, when we don't have sort of general equilibrium and taxation, and, and model, but, you can it, right? but we could, but I, I'm not sure how. I think it's going to be really mad. Then. <laughs> I mean, then we got. I mean, we could do it with taxes. Then we got to put taxes in and make it revenue neutral, at least, um, or, or the stop will show a fit. I mean, you could do well. You could do multiple comparisons simply by asking, given that you don't know where this money is coming from, would you rather spend it on A or on B? I mean, I, I don't want to say we should do, uh, I mean, I think we actually we want to do some follow-up work on much more seriously about thinking about optimal policy or in a, in a full environment. I think here we've been trying to just emphasize a lot of the key forces that are going on that are maybe not that well known. Or it's also we thought about it a lot and we didn't even understand some of this stuff until we spent Don't while. say how long time. <laughs> I don't want to admit how long it took. <laughs> But it's also difficult to, I mean, I, just for me thinking about these uh, changes in borrowing limits and how you want to think about what that costs. And that's one thing that we don't do, well, obviously, we don't do here. But one thing we could do is make the subsidies depend on uh, what human capital or what, what your investment level is, which is, would be similar to that. It would, that would not be difficult to do. We just haven't done it. Okay, thank you. We continue with uh, Laura. Where's the...